Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Medical Board of California Panel B meeting. Pursuant to the provisions of SB 189, this meeting is being conducted via WebEx. If you're having difficulty hearing the audio of this meeting using your device, please click the ellipsis button at the bottom of the WebEx application or the audio and video menu item at the top of the WebEx application and then select switch audio. You'll see an option to call in and will be provided with a telephone number, access code, and attendee ID that can be used to connect to the meeting via phone. Using the information provided, it will automatically disconnect your device's audio and connect your phone to the name you joined the meeting with. By using this method, if you're having audio problems with your device, this will allow you to hear the board meeting audio through your phone. Please see the instructions on how to connect link on the last page of the meeting agenda for step-by-step -step WebEx instructions, including screenshots. Thank you, Dr. Thorpe. You can now start the meeting. Thank you, Sean. Uh, good morning, panel members. It's uh, really nice to see everyone's face again. And, and um, Ms. Young, thanks very much for joining us. It's a, a pleasure to meet you, um, although it's remote and we, uh, we, we will look forward to the time when we can meet you in person, uh, but welcome. Um, um, Carrie, um, so well, I guess just a word of introduction. I mean, I, I, I think it's always, it's always sobering for me to have these um, hearings. I, I sort of feel like, uh, like Solomon in the Old Testament, you know, where it, it just, we, we need wisdom to, to manage this. And so I just uh, hope we enter this with sort of a sense of, of uh, you know, of, of that responsibility and, and that uh, weight. And I know you all do. Um, uh, welcome, Judge Larson, uh, Your Honor. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. And uh, uh, Kelly, if I'm mean, sorry, Carrie, if you would go ahead and um, uh, call the roll, and we'll call the meeting to order. Mr. Brooks. Here. Dr. Heelser. Here. Dr. Chung. Sorry, did you say Nicole Jung? Yes. Okay, I'm not a doctor, but oh, I apologize. <laughs> Ms. Lawson. Yes, here. Dr. Mahmood. Dr. Thorpe. Here. We have a quorum. Um, thanks very much. Uh, at, well, at nine o five, we'll call the meeting to order, and um, the first item on the agenda is um, the oral argument. Um, after non adoption of the proposed decision on Alexander Popoff, and um, um, do we have uh, representatives of Mr. or Dr. Popoff available and for the uh, DAG uh, as well, uh, uh, Mr. McEwen and Mr. Weinberg, respective, or I guess not respectively, but Mr. Weinberg for the respondent, Mr. McEwen for the Deputy Attorney General's office available. Yes, Your Honor. Robert Weinberg here. And good morning, good. Ryan McEwen from the AG's office here. Okay. Um, uh, um, Your Honor, I'll uh, turn the meeting over to you and allow you to proceed in uh, your typical fashion. Yes, thank you. All right, we do have a court reporter, Ms. Farrell, this morning. As soon as she tells me she is ready, we will go on the record and I will explain how oral argument will proceed this morning. Ms. Farrell? Good morning, Your Honor. I'm ready. All right, on the record. All right, we, good morning. We are on the record before the Medical Board of California, Panel B, in the matter of the petition for reinstatement of Alexander Popov, MD. This is oral argument after non adoption of proposed decision, Medical Board case number 800 2021 0805. Four eight. This is OAH case number two zero two two zero eight zero two six three. Today is August twenty fourth, twenty twenty two. It's approximately nine oh seven a.m. This is the date, time, and place for oral argument in the notice of hearing for oral argument. My name is Marcy Larson. I'm an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings, presiding over this matter with panel B. Uh, prior to going on the record, board members identified themselves and a quorum was, was established. May I please take the appearance, starting uh, with the Deputy Attorney General. Good morning, Your Honor. Ryan McEwen, Deputy Attorney General, appearing on behalf of the Attorney General of California. 
and, and counsel for respondent. Robert K. Weinberg for Dr. Popoff, who I believe is present, although I don't think he's going to be making any statements. All right. The board in this matter has issued an order of non-adoption of a proposed decision by an administrative law judge and has decided to determine the matter uh, itself. The board has invited particular discussion as to whether the proposed discipline should be modified. The following uh, process and time limitations will apply. Respondent has 15 minutes to make an opening argument. Deputy Attorney General will then have 15 minutes for a response. Respondent will then have five minutes for a closing argument. And the Deputy Attorney General will have five minutes for a closing argument. The arguments shall be based only on the existing record and shall not exceed the scope of the record of duly admitted evidence. No new evidence will be heard. The panel members may act, ask questions of the parties to clarify the arguments, but may not ask questions that would elicit new evidence. Myself and any panel member may ask a party to support the party's oral argument with a specific citation to the record. At the end of oral argument by counsel, I will offer respondent an opportunity to address the panel if he wishes with regards to the proposed discipline in this matter. I will first, if he does so, place him under oath. After oral argument, the, the board will go into closed, closed session uh, after the, the oral arguments this morning. I believe there are three to deliberate. The parties will not receive a decision today, but will do uh, will receive a, some, a decision sometime in the future. Again, please remember that the arguments must be based on the existing record and no new arguments will be heard. Please also remember that the board has already had the benefit of reading your briefs. All right, are there any questions before we get started? No, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. All right, All right then, Mr. Weinberg, please tell me when you are ready. I'm ready and I'll begin. Your Honor, I don't need anything close to 15 minutes. I have every confidence that everyone present today has read my written argument and has read Mr. McEwen's written argument. I'm very aware of the power of the board to protect the public from doctors who could constitute a danger. I don't know if everyone can hear me. How's my sound? We're good. I can hear you fine. Yes. Okay. Uh, Judge Foreman heard the entire case. There's no reason for me to rehash the details. I did it to some extent because this is my first crack at in the blind offering a written argument about something that I already agree with. So all I could do was summarize the best of Judge Foreman's written decision, which was taken after a fairly extensive cross-examination and direct examination of Dr. Popoff. Mr. McEwen has written, has written very well a brief uh, criticizing Dr. Popoff in certain particulars, but I'll tell you what I want to focus on today, which is whether Judge Foreman missed something. And if I analyze Mr. McEwen's brief and I analyze the reasons ostensibly that the board is being asked not to adopt this, I find myself scratching my chin because, for example, on page five, item number four, starting with line 15, it is mentioned by Mr. McEwen that my client never reported to the board his 2010 criminal conviction for spousal battery. Well, this was known. This was a criticism leveled at him a long time ago, and it's 12 years old. Um, this is the kind of thing that I find in Mr. McEwen's brief, this is rehashing things that were in the distant past, all more than a decade, 12, 13 years old, such as his drinking patterns and the fact that he did drink after the behavior involving the fraud on the federal programs. It's conceded that Dr. Popoff was an alcoholic. It had very untoward consequences in his life. Yet, the board is being asked here, or maybe the board is, is behind this, I really don't know. But Mr. McEwen 
makes references to the need to assure ourselves that he's, his drinking will not be a problem. At the same time, Mr. McEwen acknowledges that while in prison, my client went through a multi-year drug and alcohol rehabilitation process. There's no evidence in the record or anywhere else for that matter that in the last decade, my client has had a drinking problem or a drink. Now to impose bodily fluid testing requirements on a 12-year-old program, that's going around looking for problems. And I think is a, arguably, and I don't want to use this word loosely, but I think it's abusive. I think it's, it's not necessary. There's no evidence that would support a 12-year-old problem. What's more, he testified, and the judge acknowledged that this appeared to be true, that while in prison, he learned to meditate and other spiritual processes in order to cope with stress. That's unrefuted. And I think the behavior since then, he's had no incidents with law enforcement. And his marriage was patched up together even after a divorce. So there's a lot to laud here on the part of Dr. Popoff. And if we're trying to do Solomonic justice, we're going to have to recognize that the board and society at large do recognize redemption. I think this doctor, while in prison and afterwards, has dedicated himself to the possibility of being reinstated. And by the way, he didn't come back after this statutory three-year period and immediately demand reinstatement. He's waited a very, very long time. And his petition has been in the system for a long time. All during this time, no further events with law enforcement, nothing but praise from his colleagues and patients and coworkers. I think he makes an ideal candidate for reinstatement on the very terms and conditions, which, by the way, are definitely heavy and somewhat burdensome, as suggested by Judge Foreman. This is not like, okay, you get your license back, now go dance off into the merry future. No, he has lots of requirements. He would be on probation for seven years. Go back to the Bible, that's as long as it took Jacob to win the hand of Laban's two daughters. So that's seven years, not two years, three years. There will be tremendous oversight of Dr. Popoff if he is reinstated. I do not believe there's anything in the record that supports a need to go further than that. And I submit. All right, thank you. Mr. McEwen, uh, please let me know when you're ready to start. I'm ready, Your Honor. All right, you may begin. It is the position of the Attorney General's office that the petitioner has not met his burden to show that he is safe to practice medicine and should have his license reinstated. We've submitted written argument detailing why that is. Rather than repeat what's in the brief, I'd like to start by highlighting a few things that stand out when you look at the timeline of events here. First, petitioner has repeatedly demonstrated dishonesty to this board. He was dishonest on his application for a medical license. He was dishonest when he committed health care fraud on the U.S. government. And he was dishonest when he failed to disclose a spousal battery conviction to the board. You would think that after he was dishonest on his initial application and had received a pro probationary license because of that, that he would show better veracity and judgment in the future. But he did not. Second, petitioner's criminal actions and his alcohol abuse spanned a significant portion uh, of his career in medical practice. He was licensed in 2002. That order, by the way, notes that he had successfully completed psychi psychiatric treatment for alcohol abuse. Less than four years later, he joined the healthcare fraud conspiracy in Sacramento that led to his surrender. That was while he was still on probation with the board. And he participated until March of 2007. He was arrested by federal agents roughly three years later. In that three year span between leaving the fraudulent clinic and his arrest, he said that he had to close his own clinic in LA due to his alcohol habits. That's at page 51 of the transcript. He said that he left two other jobs in 2009 due to his alcohol relapse. 
That's at page 52 of the transcript. It was also around that time in August 2009 when he was arrested for spousal battery. So this is roughly eight years of medical practice, right, from licensure to his arrest, where he participates in a federal conspiracy to commit health care fraud, commits spousal battery and doesn't report it to the board, and then has to leave multiple jobs due to his drinking. Now, um, Petitioner's counsel points this out, and there's no doubt there's been quite a bit of time since these events. Most of that was spent in federal custody or on supervised release. Um, it appears that petitioner has done everything that was asked of him from the criminal sentencing. What we don't have, however, is much evidence of what he's done that was not court ordered. Uh, it appears he's found regular employment since November of 2017, and he's done some volunteer work. He's also done some medical coursework in internal medicine. That's the extent of it. It's noteworthy that petitioner completed his supervised release only recently in July of 2020. The petition for reinstatement was received about 13 months after that. So we have a, a relatively short window of time where petitioner hasn't been uh, either confined or supervised. This factual record shows that the petition should be denied. Uh, simply put, there is not clear and convincing evidence that he's been rehabilitated and should have his license restored. Um, it's more fully described in the written argument. Um, the, the relevant factors that stand out is that th these crimes were very serious in nature. Healthcare fraud is a crime of moral turpitude. Um, if you look at his actions while his license was in good standing, I just ran through them. Um, it, 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 it's, there's the multiple crimes as well as uh, alcohol abuse, admittedly um, impairing his judgment and his ability to do the job for significant portions of his career. And in terms of his reputation for truth, it's poor. Uh, his dishonesty was not based on isolated events or an isolated event. Um, he's shown a pattern of it. Now, if, if the board does decide <clears throat> that petitioner's license should be reinstated, then there are additional terms that should be imposed. Uh, one is a practice monitor because he hasn't practiced since 2010. The other terms are related to petitioner's alcohol abuse. Um, the proposed decision does not account for those, account for that whatsoever. Petitioner's counsel has referenced it. Um, it's been conceded uh, that uh, petitioner has a history of alcohol abuse. Um, it's laid out in, in our written argument. It's laid out in the petition itself. It's all over the record. Um, importantly, though, he connects his alcohol abuse to his criminal acts. He attributes alcohol use to leaving at least three jobs. Um, when asked if he ever drank alcohol while working, he first testified that he did not drink while working, but only afterwards. That's at page 52 of the transcript. Then he testified that he may have worked under the influence of alcohol from drinking the night before. That's at page 54. When asked again if he drank at the workplace, he said he did not recall. Now, his psychology treatment records from prison, however, state very clearly that he reported drinking while on the job. So there's ample evidence of abuse. Uh, what evidence do we have of recovery? Petitioner says he's been sober since 2009. Um, that is based on his own testimony. As noted before, he has a poor reputation for trustworthiness. Um, petitioner's counsel mentioned that he uh, had multi-year drug treatment. Um, there is evidence in the record that he completed drug treatment programs while in prison and also had uh, similar care in the halfway house. But the only testing that we have in the record is six months um, the last six months as part of the halfway house. Since leaving there, the halfway house, this is in July of 2017, petitioner has not engaged in any regular alcohol abuse treatment or support group meetings. Uh, he said he briefly sponsored two people in AA, uh, but that's it. For someone who credits alcohol abuse for, for so many mistakes in his life, it's problematic that he would not pursue any regular treatment after his release from confinement. Staying sober in that environment 
the lack of access to alcohol and all the oversight is not the same thing as staying sober back in society. And even if he has been sober since then, uh, let's not forget that he's essentially been out of medical practice since around that time as well. An unanswered question is whether petitioner is ready to handle the stress of being a physician without resorting back to alcohol. On this record, the public will be protected only if there is monitoring or treatment in place. And those protections are not in the proposed decision. Accordingly, our office strongly urges the board to impose the uniform standards for substance abusing licensees. These apply based on the language in the statute as laid out in our brief. Um, at a minimum, uh, conditions to abstain from use of alcohol and to submit to biological fluid testing uh, would be necessary here. The safety, the public safety requires it. Thank you. All right, next, Mr. Weinberg, you will have five minutes for closing remarks. Tell me, please, when you are ready. Ready, and I won't even come close to five minutes. If this board, right, if this board thinks that since the last evidence of his drinking is in 2009, and we are at the doorstep of 2023, that Mr. McEwen has made a case for the need for biological fluid testing then I have to concede. If that's the standard, it's beyond zealous and beyond cruel to demand that of someone 13 years, almost 14 years later, with not a whit of evidence in the last 13 or 14 years. This means that you're never over it, ever. And you could require for the rest of someone's natural life bodily fluid testing by the same reasoning that's been offered today. And the same thing about the dishonesty. Yes, there was a pattern of dishonesty that culminated in the federal offense. This is the kind of thing that happens when someone goes in the direction of a bad path. But again, that activity took place well over a decade ago. And the implication from the argument I'm hearing on the other side is you never get to reapply because they can just slap you with what you did 13 years ago. So what's the point of the entire petition process? The entire point of it, as I was given to understand it, was you were supposed to demonstrate that since that time when you were bad, you've been good. I have not heard one thing, neither during the hearing, nor from Mr. McEwen in his written argument, nor today, to undermine a single good thing that Dr. Popoff has done. And it's a front, an affront to all the efforts that he has made to pick at the fact that he never reported his spousal abuse case 12 years ago. It misses the entire point of this redemption, which has been very strongly demonstrated. I thank you for your consideration. All right, Mr. McGillan, please let me know when you're ready for your five minute closing remarks. I am, Your Honor. You may start. Uh, one point to make, uh, which is just that on the on the alcohol terms that were that we're seeking to have imposed here, there's a presumption when you're disciplined uh, for uh, acts that involve alcohol abuse that you're a substance abusing licensee, and that the uniform standards should apply. There's also a catch-all that if uh, there's other evidence in the record of substance abuse, the board can uh, impose necessary terms. So we've easily uh, met our burden that way. Uh, what we don't have is any evidence to rebut that, right? The discipline and uh, on his license occurred admittedly uh, 10 years ago. However, the evidence that we have that he, this is no longer a problem for him is, is, is really thin. It's essentially based off of his word, which as we've said uh, and shown uh, it, it, it is not very strong and should not uh, be given much weight. Uh, and so there, there, there really is uh, no evidence here that he is safe to practice without uh, these terms put in place. Thank you. All right, Mr. Weinberg, does Dr. Popoff wish to address the uh, panel members with regards to the proposed discipline? No, Your Honor. Um. 
I'd like to say a word. Good morning. Oh, oh, I was mistaken. I just, I'm sorry about that. Okay. All right. So, so Dr. Popov, before you say anything, I need to swear you in. So if you would please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under a penalty of perjury that the testimony you give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. All right. You may begin. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, um, medical board members, Mr. Miguel. Um, I, I'm sorry for the noise. It's construction next door, um, but I'll be very brief. Um, I totally agree with everything uh, district attorney said um, today, and I'm completely um, aware of uh, the events in the past um, and the uh, mistrust that certainly uh, society has towards me. And I don't mind at all, um, whatever, if I were to be given my license back, my medical license back, um, I don't mind at all any alcohol monitoring uh, for as frequent as it needs to be at all. Um, or any other measures, as a matter of fact, of monitoring. Um, and um, as I mentioned in the previous hearing, I'm not sure I deserve my medical license. With all my acts in the past, was if I were to give him a chance, um, I'll be grateful and try to give it back to the community. Um, I'm not sure I'll be able to do too many things as far as practicing medicine because I'm prohibited from uh, billing Medicare, Medi-Cal, and just now learned workers' compensation and being on probation or private insurances, but I'll try my best if I give him a chance. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm going to now ask our panel members if they have any questions for council, uh, starting with our chair, Dr. Thorpe. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Your Honor. I, um, actually, uh, I, I do have some questions, but I would defer to my panel members uh, to start uh, asking the questions. And if if there if my questions aren't answered, then I will I will ask my questions at the end. All right, Dr. Heltz, do you have any questions for council? Uh, no questions, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Brooks. Any any questions? Ms. Young, any questions? No questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Ms. Lawson, any questions? Uh, yes, thank you. I uh, I had a question. It was about um, uh, why there was such resistance to the alcohol and other monitoring proposal. It, it seems that question has been answered by Mr. Popov just now. Thank you. All right, then I'll go back to Dr. Thorpe. Do you wish to ask any questions? Actually, uh, no. I, I I did have questions, but I. Uh, but they were also related to the issue relating substance monitoring and uh, my questions have been answered. All right, then this concludes the arguments in the matter. The record is closed. The case is submitted and we are off the record in this matter. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you to all of you. Thank you. Dr. Thorpe, I was going to turn it back to you for the next matter to announce. Yeah, yes. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, the next um, the next oral argument is uh, the oral argument after non-adoption of the proposed decision regarding Jordan Michael Sachs, MD. Um, and uh, I'm just wondering if uh, our legal uh, counsel is available. The, uh, Attorney for the respondent, Ann Larson, and the Deputy Attorney General, Thomas Ostley. Dr. Thorpe and uh, Judge Larson, I have recused myself from this case. Shall I go ahead and log off? Yes, please. Uh, thank you, Do Dr. Helzer. How are we? Uh, um, Carrie, could you text me when uh, you're ready for me to rejoin? I could. 
could, but I do not have your phone number and this is open session. If you would like to email it to me to my MBC email address, then I will text you when we're done. I will do that. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Dr. Helzer. I see. Uh, Ms. Larson Esquire available. And is uh, Mr. Ostley available? Ms. Larson, you're on mute. Could, there you go. Ms. Larson, if you could go ahead and say something just to make sure your audio is working. You're, so you're back on mute. If you could hit the I try one more time. I must have toggled back and forth twice. Okay, I'm it, here it's now. It's very sensitive. <laughs> Thank you very much. I realize we're about 20 minutes early than what we uh, anticipated. On our schedule. Carrie, do we have a way to reach Mr. Ostley? He's there. He's oh, here. Oh, he is. Okay, I'm sorry. I did not. I apologize. Okay, uh, Your Honor, uh, if you would go ahead and proceed on uh, this case. As soon as Ms. Farrell, our court reporter, tells me she is re ready, we will go on the record. Ready, Your Honor. All right, on the record. Good morning. We are on the record before the Medical Board of California, Panel B, in the matter of the accusa accusation against Jordan Michael Sachs, MD. This is oral argument after non adoption of proposed decision. Medical Board case number 800 2018 041173. OAH case number 2022080264. Today is August 24th, 2022. It's approximately 9.34 a.m. We are here at the date, time, and location of, that was set for the oral argument and the notice of hearing for oral argument. My name is Marcy Larson. I am an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings. I'm presiding over uh, the matter with panel B board members this morning. Before going on the record, the board members identified themselves and a quorum was established. May I please take the appearance of the Deputy Attorney General? Thomas Osley, Deputy Attorney General, appearing for the complainant. And Counsel for Respondent. Ann Larson on behalf of Dr. Sachs. And Dr. Sachs is present as well, correct? Uh, good morning, that's correct. Good morning. The board in this matter has issued an order of non-adoption of the proposed decision by the Administrative Law Judge and has decided to determine the matter itself. The board has invited particular discussion of whether the proposed discipline should be modified. The process and time limitations um, will apply as follows. Respondent will have 15 minutes to make opening argument. Dep the Deputy Attorney General will then have 15 minutes for a response. Respondent will then have five minutes for closing argument. And the Deputy Attorney General will have five minutes for closing argument. These time limits will be strictly enforced. The arguments shall be based only on the existing record and shall not exceed the scope of the record of the duly admitted evidence. No new evidence will be heard. The panel members may ask questions of the parties to clarify the arguments, but may not ask questions that would elicit new evidence. Myself and panel members may ask a party to support a party's oral argument on a matter with specific citation to the record. At the end of oral argument by counsel, I will offer respondent an opportunity to address the panel members regarding the proposed uh, whether the proposed discipline should be modified. If uh, Dr. Sachs uh, chooses to address the panel members, I will swear him in. After oral argument, the board will go into closed session to deliberate. The parties will not receive a decision today. Please remember that all arguments must be based on the existing record and no new evidence will be heard. Please also remember that the board has also had the benefit of reading your briefs as well. All right, any questions before we begin? None. No. All right, and I will um, try also to remember to give a one minute warning if you're coming up on your time. Ms. Larson, if you would please tell me when you are ready. <clears throat> I'm ready. All right, you may begin. Thank you. We have provided a written argument to the board and um, the intent there was to show a roadmap 
with specific citations to the record, many citations to the record, um, in support of each of our points as to why the um, administrative law judge um, got this record correct, that there was simply um, insufficient evidence to support the findings um, against that have been levied against Dr. Sachs. You have the transcripts, the exhibits, and all the materials necessary. Um, I'm sure somewhat overwhelmingly so when you come in cold to a case, but the materials are there and they do lead to the conclusion that the administrative law judge found is that there was um, insufficient of his evidence presented by the state to warrant um, a finding that would support discipline against Dr. Sachs. The crux of this non-adoption appears from what I can discern to be centered on discrepancies between what the parents, primarily the mother, report about the child's condition and the testimony and contemporaneous charting of Dr. Sachs. And in essence, the failures alleged go beyond what Dr. Sachs is alleged to have done and include the three nurses who were part of the treatment team. And I know the three nurses are not here, that they're not being looked at today, but it is important. And I think that I address that somewhat in my uh, written argument. I'll address it a little more here too. And in essence, Dr. Sachs's credibility is at issue. We have an expert for the state that says physical examination appropriately charted met the standard of care. The um, history taking, the um, Dr. Scarcella, the board's expert, found that there were some deficiencies, but said it barely met the standard of care. None of these are warranting discipline. The only thing different would have to be whether one believes what the mother's version of events are over what the medical records taken by um, or, uh, written by the providers, including Dr. Sex, over the testimony that has been given. And the conclusion could only be drawn that if the version of events as the mother recalls it is relied on over that of the medical record and of Dr. Sex, we would have to come to the conclusion that Dr. Sachs falsified records, that he made it up, that the exam that he charted, which looks like not a lot of detail, but in a lot, it is in a lot of medical abbreviation, that that simply wasn't done, that the one um, positive finding and you all are very well versed in, in medical board matters, a positive finding, meaning something that was an abnormality versus the negative findings. A positive finding was made to the tune of abnormal bowel sounds. These were identified. All the experts agree the only way you can identify bowel sounds is by auscultating a stethoscope listening to the abdomen, what is the pitch of those bowel sounds, the frequency, the absence, the quality and character of those. And Dr. Sachs testified um, fairly extensively at the hearing about what those meant. So you would have to say that this was something that was manufactured because the mother said he never auscultated, he never listened to her son's abdomen. So we're really looking at, did this record get falsified by Dr. Sachs? And the evidence simply does not support that in any way. Um, the mother has proven herself to have um, inaccurate recollections. And the expectation is that 
The deep impact of the devastating death of her young son impacts that memory. Um, she also has from her, um, from the complaint that you have read in the materials and the way of testifying, she continues to have extreme anger and a desire for vengeance. And again, a 12 year old son being lost to an extremely rare condition as the pediatric gastro uh, enterologist testified to about how this condition um, evolves and how rare it is in someone of this age. Almost, almost rarely never happens. Certainly she's devastated. But it's a probably a combination of all those things that I think that need to be considered by the panel. Um, for example, at um, page 22A228 of the record in a bulleted section of the complaint, she states that Dr. Sachs never bothered checking with his patient um, or us to see how his patient was doing over the entire evening while Nicholas kept vomiting and lay dying only a few feet from him. She refers to this often, this idea that this was a child who was actively dying in the hospital. The records do not reflect this. Um, the records reflect that this is an individual who by the time he came to the emergency room, he continued to have some nausea and vomiting, uh, not unusual complaints and abdominal cramping. That is assessed not only by the initial nurse when he came in, but Dr. Sachs and by subsequent nursing notes. Um, subsequent nursing um, evaluation performed at A51 to A53 of the medical record. And of note, the um, nurse SS is Shoshana Sclair and as um, the mother testified, this was never done. Ms. Sclair never performed um, an examination of her child and it was uh, a falsified record. And this would be at um, page 135 to 136 of the uh, first day of testimony, that would be January 3rd, 2022. So this is a false record according to the mother. And I bring this up, it's what happened that everyone is not talking to her son who is not um, making any assessments. She said that Nurse Gargar the nurse that was the primary nurse of the patient. She says in the complaint that she rarely came in to see um, the son, but she says at the hearing at page 137 of her, uh, that would again be day one, Nurse Garger came in a total of 12, 12 times or so from the time that Dr. Sachs had left the room until the time of discharge. And what did Ms. Garger do? She never did anything. She, it says, she never did anything except come in and look somewhat confused and did not touch him or talk to us and just left. Again, those things simply, a nurse coming in 12 times, she was pretty sure of that count. That doesn't make sense. Um, there are several other areas within the record that, again, specifically point to a mother's shaded recollection, shaded due to the enormous loss, we believe. Um, and I think that, well, let me just, I have uh, another example is, let if you look at page A45 of the medical record, there's an ambulance record. 
So we have an ambulance response unit that comes in and she says she told the ambulance people that he was in excruciating pain, that he had blood, potentially had blood in his vomit. This is at page 113 of January 3rd transcript. Um, and that she informed the paramedics of that. And yet at page A45, the Marin County EMS sheet, none of that is recorded. She said she told them about the severe diaphoresis. That's not recorded here. It says abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, um, quality of the, um, of the pain is cramping. So here's another the, the paramedics apparently got it wrong too. They were given information about excruciating pain and about um, blood in the vomit. They did not rec record this. We talk about the, um, we talked briefly about the bowel sounds and I, I did address that in my um, argument in the record. But if we look at page, um, a26, which is Dr. Sachs's note, says bowel sounds are increased. So this is something, this tells him something. And he also writes then later, hyperactive BS, hyperactive bowel sounds. All right, so this is a patient who has something a little ab abnormal but he had a soft abdomen with no tenderness that he writes in two specific places. The mother says she never, he never touched my son's abdomen. The, um, he writes that there was no rebound and no guarding. Those are things that are specific ways of performing the abdominal examination to determine if there is um, acute findings in the abdomen, which is what this patient is there for on this visit. Dr. West talked about that, the expert for Dr. Sachs. Patients come to the emergency room to find out, is there something abnormal um, about a process that would require more follow-up? And in this case, in a child, with nausea, vomiting, and cramping, an appropriate assessment was done per the state's expert, per Dr. Scarcella's expert, expertise. He said the exam was appropriate. Um, the, we've talked about um, Ms. Gargar and Ms. Sclair, and at page, Eight, I believe of my brief, I do point to other factors that are, they're very, very dissimilar between the events relayed by others and what the physicians, what the physician did that day. We have Dr. Sachs as a member of a, the medical community with, uh, within San Rafael, who has a position outside of Kaiser within the community. There were several um, witnesses testifying on his behalf, including the chiefs of the department that talked about how much this was a bit of an elite department in the emergency room um, group um, of Kaiser. And it's a sought after position and Dr. Sachs has been a very valuable member. One minute. Thank you very much. Um, in terms of the reassessment, um, criticism. When you have a patient with a benign abdomen, the medical necessity dictates whether or not there's follow-up that needs to be done. Relying on nursing to relay information about whether for um, a patient passes a PO challenge is appropriate and within the standard of care in the ED department. There was no medical indication. I will ask you to look at the um, video clips of the child as he left the emergency room. The mother stated this was the worst she had ever seen him, the illest she had ever seen him in her life. And she, um, what, what she says is so different than what Dr. Scarcella says. 
All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Mr. Osley, please tell me when you are ready. I'm ready, Your Honor. You may begin. Well, thank you. Um, well, good morning, members of the board, Ms. Larson, Dr. Sachs. So I'm going to focus on what happened in this case. First, the timeline of events of what happened, and then what was documented. And I'm going to be focusing on Dr. Sachs's testimony, what Dr. Sachs says he did, and what happened in this case. I'm also going to be focusing on Nurse Gargar and what she says happened, because I don't think we need to get into a credibility battle between the parents and Dr. Sachs. I think just looking at Dr. Sachs's version of events taken in the light most favorable to him, um, there's still a significant public safety issue that needs to be addressed. So this case began with Nicholas swimming until about 3 p.m. He went home from swimming. He was playing video games. And at about 5 p.m., his mother asked Nicholas to go up and take a shower. He did. After taking the shower, he collapsed. This was about two hours after he was swimming. Uh, the mother testified that he was in excruciating pain. He was contorted. He was unable to move or get up. That he had vomited, and she thought there may have been blood in the vomit, but wasn't sure. She called for his brother. They were unable to bring him down to the car to drive him to the hospital, so they called for an ambulance. During the ambulance ride, the mother described being contorted, profuse sweating, um, and being incredibly ill. He arrives at the hospital at about 5.48, uh, and that's according to the uh, medical records. At 5.48, he's arrived, and Nurse Gargar does the presenting history. At 5.51, she triages Nicholas as a level two. The records say that he was up triaged. Nurse Gargar testified about that uh, assessment and his triage. She said that he was essentially a level two is one step below CPR. She said that he was weak, that he did not appear stable, and that this was going to be a patient that was going to require um, extra care or more care would be required. The next uh, note is Dr. Sachs ordering oral Zolfran for Nick. The oral Zolfran was acknowledged, and I believe that was at about 8.09, and he immediately vomited after being administered the oral Zolfran. The next note is at uh, 6.19, and that is to another administration of oral Zolfran. And it's important to note that at this 6.02 order for the oral Zolfran, there's a comment that says, PO challenge, please. Uh, PO being by mouth, the challenge being make sure that he can um, retain something, either foods or fluids, after having the oral Zolfran. That note is only in the 1802, it's military time, 602 order. It is not in the subsequent orders. It's also worth noting that Nurse Gargar, immediately after finishing Nicholas's triage, at 555, she went on break for an hour. So she was then gone. At 8, 819, there's another oral um, admit, or order for Zofran. That was not completed. There's no note about a PO challenge. Then there's a subsequent order for IV Zofran. And this is important. The IV Zofran is combined with an order for discharge. Nicholas was ordered discharge before he was able to tolerate fluids before the Zofran had even been administered. Now, Nurse Gargar, and I'll get into more detail about her testimony. Her um, transcript is part of the administrative record, and I believe that Judge Cox did not address these issues that were in that transcript. And this would be in the judge's decision, paragraphs 35 to about uh, 49. And one of those issues is, is that when uh, Gurley Gargar was on break, it was her understanding that her supervisor had already printed the discharge paperwork. When Nurse Gargar was asked if she took vitals and was continuing to take Nicholas's vital signs, including a half hour before discharge, she said yes, because he had been discharged at 
So this idea that there was going to be continuing care and that the PO challenge was going to be completed. If you read the transcript from Nurse Gargar, there is at the minimum confusion over that or a misunderstanding of what was to be done. And when you look at the records, they clearly say that there is going to be the Izizolfran and discharge. There is nothing about a PO challenge in those orders. Furthermore, Dr. Sachs himself testified that that order was not made conditional. And this is uh, missing from Judge Cox's decision. She says that there's an implication that it was implied that it would have to be conditional, but there is a box to check to make a discharge conditional. That was not done. And if you look at the transcript and Nurse Gargar's description of what she was doing, it was all towards finishing and getting Nicholas out of the hospital. It was not continuing to provide care. And so then at seven o'clock when Nicholas, uh, I'm sorry, when Nurse Gargar returns from break, some, sometime between seven and 714, Dr. Sachs says Nurse Gargar communicated to him that Nicholas had passed the PO challenge. Well, if the, if the Zolfran was administered at 630, giving it a half hour to work, that would have been right when she came back from break. But if you look at the transcript from Nurse Gargar, she says Nurse Dela Cruz told her that. That she didn't observe it herself. Nurse Dela Cruz told her that. She then later says that she told Dr. Sachs, didn't really remember the details, and nothing about this is charted. Nothing from Nurse Dela Cruz, nothing from Nurse Gargar, nothing from Dr. Sachs. So one of the critical issues is if there is a prerequisite, if there is a, a, a fact that is needed before discharge, does that need to be documented before discharge occurs? In this case, that did not happen. So then this other thing that is missing from both Judge Cox's, well, it is mentioned in Judge Cox's decision. And this is in paragraph 49, there's a footnote. The footnote references, references Dr. Sachs saying that he went to go stand in the doorway. And this was after the discharge. Now this discharge that was already in process at 630, Dr. Sachs entered notes at 714 saying that Nicholas had passed the PO challenge and that all patient questions were answered. Now, Judge Cox says it's reasonable to believe that the nurses were gonna answer those questions. But we know from the record that no questions were ever answered. And then Dr. Sachs says at some point between that note and Nicholas leaving the hospital, he stood in the doorway for moral support. Well, there's a few reasons why that's problematic. One is, is that Dr. Sachs himself testified that in regard to the EMT and the triage, that he didn't put much stock into what other people were saying because he was trained not to trust others to verify it himself. He says that at page 101 of the transcript and again at page 166. In this case, he says, don't trust and verify when it comes to the EMTs and Nurse Gargar's triage, but when it comes to whether or not Nicholas has passed the PO challenge, then he just takes Nurse Gargar's word for it. But more importantly, he then puts himself in the doorway of Nicholas. He could have said, you're feeling better, right? This is a one sentence, just a simple sentence. You're okay, you're better, anything like that. None of that was done. Dr. Sachs admits he never asked a follow-up question when he was in the doorway. He never asked any of this, and none of this is charted. Now, while there is a dispute over whether or not Dr. Sachs was in the doorway, whether or not he did the exam correctly, again, taking Dr. Sachs' testimony is true and in the light most favorable to him. If he simply would have asked, are you holding down fluids? The answer would have been no. And by Dr. Sachs' own testimony, he would not have released him then. He would have then kept him for additional observation, possibly ordered labs or imaging. They would have kept going. Now, there's another issue of this thing of the parents and their uh, animosity towards Dr. Sachs. There's no evidence of that in the record. The complaint was not filed when this happened. The complaint wasn't filed until the uh, depositions were taken and the parents saw a discrepancy between what they experienced and what was being recorded, including what was missing from the medical records. That's where there was a problem. That's when they filed a complaint because they realized that what they had been told had happened and what they believed had happened was not correct. Now, 
the other issue was is you know this thing about being in the doorway did the parents have questions and the mother testified she absolutely did and had there been an opportunity she would have said a few things which is why is it that they're being discharged when he has not been able to hold down fluids that right there would have stopped all of this even by dr sax's testimony nicholas would have stayed she also wanted to know you know, why it says this thing about keeping him hydrated, he's not holding anything down. The discharge instructions were frustrating and confusing because they're saying, we'll bring him back if these conditions resume. And the mother was saying, they haven't stopped. You know, we were sending me home based on these set of facts that aren't true. And that was, could have easily been resolved if Dr. Sachs had just said, how are you doing when he was in the doorway? A simple question to verify these things. None of that was done. Um, just one moment, please. There was also testimony from Dr. Sachs that he was informed by Nurse Gargar that the parents appeared nervous, and this was sometime after the discharge. And by discharge, I mean at 714. Again, there was nothing done about that. If the parents were nervous, there was no explanation of why, just that he was told that by Nurse Gargar and he didn't go back and follow up on why they were nervous yet he had been in the doorway that after that but he didn't ask any questions so this idea that he's there for moral support but not to follow up to see if those conditions um, had been alleviated or if the zofran was working uh, and that was another frustrating thing for the parents was getting the and this was testified to by the mother in regard to being sent home and dr Sachs being in the doorway which is they were being given the same oral medication that Nicholas had not been able to hold down and was still not able to keep anything down. So how was that expected to change when he gets home? And so she was frustrated about not having her questions answered about how to give it to him and when and what was expected of her, given that his condition had not changed. And for, those, for that testimony, that's on page 148 to 149 of the transcript. And there's another, uh, I think, very important point, and this is from Nurse Gargar. She was asked, did you expect Dr. Sachs to go back and examine the patient? And I think this is important because her care, her decision-making was informed by this belief that Dr. Sachs was also gonna go back and check on Nicholas. And so when the parents were saying things and things weren't being communicated, all of this is in the context of she believed that Dr. Sachs would go back to reassess. And when she was asked, and this is on its exhibit um, Z-186, and the exhibit page and the testimony page are the same, page 186, it's on line 20. And she was asked, did you ever want him, meaning Dr. Sachs, to see the patient again? And Nurse Gargar said, I mean, that's their job, isn't it? And it's clear that that is what she expected to have happen, to have Dr. Sachs go back and reassess. This confusion over the PO challenge and whether or not it had been successfully completed, all of these things were a result of Dr. Sachs not communicating clear orders, not communicating clearly with the nursing staff, and not communicating with the parents or the patient at all after that initial assessment. And then, this other issue of whether or not the um, son was, the, the, the child was sick and his condition and this dispute. The mother testified that her son played Little League. He was a star of his Little League team. He was incredibly active. He never stopped talking that in all of his classes, he had to sit in the front of the class so he wouldn't talk to his classmates. One minute. The parents understood that his condition was very different. If he was a quiet, docile child, they may not have noticed that. But from the parents, if they had been asked, they were incredibly concerned because he was so out of character during that time, including his walk to get into the van. She testified normally his feet never touched the ground. He just flew into the back seat. She had to help him in. So for the parents, this was incredibly distressing. Thank you. Ms. Larson, uh, you will have Five minutes for your closing argument. Please tell me when you are ready. All right, I am ready. 
You may start. The deposition transcript, one of the things I do want to bring to um, your attention is that the deposition transcript of Ms. Gargar was not submitted by the court for all purposes, but rather there was um, reference made by Dr. Sachs to an area and my understanding, and I've been searching to try to find it, is that Ms. Gargar did not testify her deposition transcript. She was never cross-examined by me. She was never examined by me. That this um, deposition transcript from the underlying case was something that was going to be used because she was on the state's witness list as someone they were calling in to testify. Dr. Scarcella never commented on those issues. The argument by the state was not based on evidence in the record of the expert witnesses. And I think that that's something key that you need to look at. These are assumptions that are made. There was not um, um, Dr. Scarcella saying that uh, the various things related to Ms. Gargar, he did not even read that transcript as part of his review of the case. So the use of the Gargar transcript and what was said um, in the underlying case is something that really should not be considered here. And the judge had admitted it just for a very limited purpose. And I can't find that here right now, but I will let you know that. But again, clear and convincing evidence, the burden of proof. You're well aware of that, and that is a, a high bar. And to meet that high bar, there has to be um, a basic um, meeting of the minds in turn um, that no reasonable person would find that this was not the case, that this events happened. And the burden was not met in the case um, at issue. Um, and they do the evidence was insufficient to support findings against Dr. Sachs based on the expert testimony. Um, we need to look at the fact of the events here occurring in 2016. Six years have passed since then. We know from the um, evidence presented by Dr. Meyer and Dr. Vlahos that um, this doctor has never had any matters against him. He was not disciplined by Kaiser. He has, aside from this case, there has been nothing um, against him. I will say this, you know that this is not um, something that came to the board on an 801 report. It was not settled in the underlying case as to Dr. Sachs. That was as to a nurse. This is a well-respected physician at Kaiser San Rafael ER and in the greater San Rafael medical community. Any discipline imposed at this time is going to be something that would be punitive and not um, aimed at rehabilitation. He has practiced for six years. He estimates based on the frequency of pediatric patients that that's hundreds of pediatric patients and literally thousands of patients at Kaiser San Rafael over these six years. So such findings, um, if they are not supported by what the experts say and are not meeting that clear and convincing evidence, which we contend they do not, then they need to be, then the um, ALJ Cox's findings need to be um, sustained. That's all I have. All right, thank you. Mr. Osley, please tell me when you are ready. I'm ready. You may start. So the experts, their opinions do support the finding that Dr. Sachs failed to meet the standard of care for Nicholas and it was an extreme departure. Specifically in Judge Cox's decisions, it's paragraphs 73, 74, and 75. That's where she discusses that Dr. Scarcello's most serious criticism was Dr. Sachs's decision not to go back and reassess Nicholas. And there's a couple of important points to take away from that. One is Dr. West, um, the expert from the respondent. He stated that Dr. Scarcella, the complainant's expert, got it wrong. That Dr. Sachs did not order discharge until the PO challenge was passed. Well, one, we know that the PO challenge was never passed. 
two, we know that the um, expert that Dr. West in his report says that Dr. Sachs waited, he was informed that the patient passed a PO challenge and then he ordered discipline. That did not happen. He ordered or IV Zolfran and discharge at the same time. Even Dr. Sachs testified erroneously about that. He said that he waited until the PO challenge was passed before ordering discharge. That is not correct. That did not happen that way. And the reason, and, and again, in the light most favorable to Dr. Sachs, he got those facts wrong because of the scant documentation, because there was no documentation of the PO challenge or who says it was passed and when. None of that was there. And if you look at J Dr. Sachs's earlier testimony regarding that issue, it's a lot of I don't knows and I don't remembers. And then he refreshes his recollection by looking at things like Gurley Gargar's deposition to remind himself what happened. That is not meeting the standard of care for Nicholas as far as documenting his care, especially when it's something as important as deciding whether or not to release him. There is this also um, issue about whether or not Dr. Sachs was falsifying or just, you know, cutting corners. Well, in his charting, he says that all questions were answered. They weren't. If he was expecting someone else to do it, he didn't document who was supposed to do it. There's no order from Dr. Sachs saying, answer these people's questions. None of that was done. So the discrepancy between what Dr. Sachs says he did and what the other witnesses say happened could easily be just described as he expected to do it later and was documented in advance, or he was assuming facts that he already believed to be true. And if you look at the testimony of Dr. Sachs's witness, um, Dr. West, he says it was a 95 to 97% chance that this was either gonna be food poisoning or gastroenteritis. And that once appendicitis was ruled out, it's almost certainly gonna be one of those two things and the treatments are the same. That informs and explains why Dr. Sachs wouldn't take the time to go back. It's not that he was in the light most favorable to him. It's not a nefarious reason. It's just that he already assumed what was wrong. He already knew. The problem was, is that he was assuming facts that were not correct. And had he gone back and known that he was not tolerating IV Zofran, that he was continuing to vomit, that his pain was extreme and appeared to have been intermittent, which also would have been con consistent with a mid-gut um, bovulvus, those things all would have happened differently. And so the main crux of this case, I believe, is whether Dr. Sachs can give inconsistent and confusing orders regarding whether or not a PO challenge should be done, whether he can order discharge at the same time as the IV Zofran and not make it conditional. It does not say that One in the records. And then expect nurses to follow through when they've not been given direct orders and none of this communication has happened? Is it enough to just pass in the hallway and say that he passed when actually it was Nurse Dela Cruz that told Nurse Gardner? It's like playing that telephone game. And so I think there's issues with communication, there's issues with record keeping, there's issues with following through. Go back and look at this testimony about being in the doorway. If he just would have asked Nicholas, how are you doing? All of this would have been avoided. Submitted. All right, Ms. Larson, does Dr. Sack wish to address the boards with regards to the proposed decision and any penalty? He does. All right, Dr. Sachs, the first thing I need to do is swear you in. If you would please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. You may begin. All right. Um, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the board. Um, so I want to take a, a moment to just sort of discuss this case and, and I think the appropriate way to approach some of these issues before diving into some of the specifics, hopefully without um, going back through many of the things addressed in the brief. So Dr. Sachs, I want to just remind you that you're um, limited to just addressing the board with regards to the appropriate resolution in this matter, the appropriate. I know that, that the judge proposed decision was a dismissal. Um, and so you can address the appropriateness of that um, rather than going back through all of the evidence, which your lawyer has already done. 
So okay. if you could limit your statements to the board with regards to that. Okay, uh, thank you for the clarification, Your Honor. Um, well, I, I think the most important thing I can say here is that I have devoted my life to the practice of medicine and to emergency medicine. Um, I've been a practicing physician uh, and working in medicine for 17 years. Um, and during that time, I've had a long record of excellent patient care without complaint, without significant negative outcome. Um, and I, I've always dedicated my life to service. Um, I joined the National Guard to serve my country. I've taken a position as the medical director of the emergency medical services system in the city of San Rafael to serve my larger community. And I take my oath to my patients very seriously. Um, the allegations in this case are anathema uh, to my very being um, and are obviously difficult um, to deal with. I know that um, memory is a difficult thing. And in this case, I think we have three sorts of information um, to think about. And one is subjective memory. And I'm a parent, I'm sure many of you are parents. And I know that if something was to befall someone in my family, my memory would be impacted by the emotional weight of those events. Um, another source of information that we can consider when trying to adjudicate a case from six and a half years ago is the non-disputed information, the vital signs of the patient, uh, things of that nature. Um, and then the third is the charting, which was done contemporaneously. I know Mr. Osley has made several assertions about standard practice in the emergency department regarding nurse communication, or for example, the expectation that when an order is placed, that it is completed prior to a patient being discharged. Um, I think those assertions are contradicted by the record and by the expert testimony um, in the underlying hearing. Um, I would point out that there are many parts of my chart um, in this case that could not be obtained um, without directly interacting with the patient and the mother. Um, I, I draw your attention, for instance, to page 825. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I make yeah. a, yeah. Can I ask a point of order? Yes. Um, I believe that the witness is now testifying about the facts of the case as opposed to proposed disposition. Should I object when that happens or? Yes, so, so Dr. Sachs, I reminded you with the limited scope of your statement and who the board members are. So if you would, again, please focus any statement to the board with regards to the pro proposed dismissal of this action against you, the appropriateness of that proposed decision or any other penalty okay. considered. My, my apologies, Your Honor. Obviously, it's an issue of um, significant weight to me, um, but I will restrain myself. Um, I guess the, the last thing I would I would point out is, you know, I think ALJ Cox had done a, an excellent job. The proposed non-adoption was based on the idea of protecting the public. Um, I'd point out that I've been in continuous practice since this case happened six and a half years ago. Um, and I've seen somewhere between 18 and 20,000 patients during that period without a complaint, a negative outcome or, or anything else to suggest that I practice in a fashion which uh, blatantly disregards standards of care as is alleged in this case. Um, I feel that the outcome is obviously tragic beyond words, um, but I cannot fathom the things that have been alleged in this case. Um, so I would simply ask that the board thoroughly review the hearing, the underlying testimony, the expert testimony, um, and take into consideration the time that has elapsed um, when considering whether or not I pose a threat to the public in continued practice of medicine. Thank you. I'm now going to ask our, our panel members if they have any questions, um, starting with our chair, Dr. Thorpe. Um, thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Again, I, uh, I would defer to my colleagues uh, on the panel. I will have a question um, at the end, but I'd like to have my, my colleagues have an opportunity first to ask questions if they, if they so desire. Dr. Heltz uh, recused himself from this matter, has not been present during oral argument. Mr. Brooks, do you ha have any questions for, doc uh, for, for the party's counsel? I do. So I have a question for you. Is it from a- and, So you're, you're a little bit faint. I'm having a hard time hearing you. Is this uh, any better? Is this any better? But not for me. Can I, I can hear you, but it's, but it's a little bit uh, faint. Um, I'll try to speak it a little closer to my mic if that helps it at all. That's, That's better. better. I, I, I apologize for the freaky uh, video here. Um, is it part of your standard care of practice to take contemporaneous notes 
or do you usually document the patient as you're you know performing certain duties because to make sure sorry i want to make sure i understand the question you're asking if i'm charting uh while patient care is ongoing or if i complete the chart at the end of the patient interaction is that correct that is correct and, and, and this last part of that question is um, are you using like epic or any other type of um note taking uh, device to aid in your memory uh in regards to the memory question do you mean in the setting of of this current proceeding or you mean during the care of the patient uh both uh, no in terms of the, uh, for the patients your standard That's care it. standard okay. operation yeah so uh, we do use epic as the electronic medical record system at kaiser um so my typical practice is to start charting uh when caring for the patient um, and complete uh as much of the patient chart as possible and I think, as was noted in Dr. West's testimony, part of working in the emergency department is the unpredictability uh, of the environment. So at any moment, a uh, patient requiring extensive care could appear requiring you to be involved in their care for two or three hours. So often uh, we chart sort of as quickly and furiously as we can um, to make sure that we're as up to date as possible. Um, before seeing a patient, I typically would review their prior medical history and any visits um, that they've had or interactions with the healthcare system. So as to be aware of any of their particular concerns um, and certainly during their care, I'll often review uh, updated vital signs or things of that nature. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. All right, any further questions, Mr. Brooks? No. None. Uh, Ms. Young, any questions for Dr. Sachs? Um, no questions for Dr. Sachs, but question for the attorneys. Um, curious whether in the record there is any um, information about the result of the underlying civil case against Kaiser as to Dr. Sachs. And this would just be a question limited to what's already in the record as opposed to eliciting any new evidence. So if Ms. Larson or Mr. Osley can answer that question if it is in the in the record that's before before the board. Um, the only um, reference that I believe um, is before the board is in the um, parent complaint, and that says that um, that there was a settlement um, in our favor, and they talk about that. Um, it doesn't say as to Dr. Sachs, but I believe that um, the fact that the, this came in through a complaint and not an 801. Uh, and there's no 801 in the evidence. So that establishes that there was no um, settlement based on Dr. Sachs's care and treatment. Mr. Osley, do you have any information in the record to point to, to Ms. Young's question? Um, yeah, I believe it's in the parents' complaint. And I believe that the complaint states that the wrongful death suit was settled in their favor. So when it's, it's the parents' favor um, that it was settled. Right. Ms. Young, any additional questions? Sorry, can you do you all have a citation to the where the complaint is in the record? I know that the record is quite voluminous, so I just want to make sure. Uh, yeah. May I ask a follow up question there just for clarification? Mm -hmm. I have the okay. site for the complaint if you'd like it. I believe if it's um, A220 to A. 234. And is it accurate that there's no detail provided in that um, statement in the record as to the terms of the settlement or to whom the settlement involved or applies? I would have to look to verify. It it does not, it does not, it says how much it was. It just doesn't say um, it was said against Kaiser, you know, per, Permanente Medical Group and Kaiser Foundation Hospital was settled in our favor for the full penalty allowed by law. They give an amount um, in November 2017. But it does not state um, as to the findings. I do know that they're, um, well, again. Please don't, please don't provide any information that's not in the record. Uh, just to follow up on, on Ms. Zhang's question, um, 
there's no, is there any evidence in the record of the board receiving notification of the settlement vis-a-vis -vis Dr. Sachs as would be required by law if there was a settlement that involved Dr. Sachs? There is no such evidence in the record because there was, yeah. There's nothing in the record. Thank you. Ms. Young, any additional questions? No additional questions, thank you. Ms. Lawson, any additional questions? Uh, no, thank you. Dr. Thorpe, I'm going to go back to you. Uh, any questions for council? Um, yes, thank you, Your Honor. I, I, um, I mean, obviously, this is a tragic case, and I, I can, uh, uh, I can empathize with Dr. Sachs as well, knowing that, um, you know, uh, uh, every intent to try to do the right thing. But this case would not be before us had nothing um, catastrophic occurred. Um, and I think that's the that's the that's the the challenge is that looking at the medical record and um, seeing the abdominal exam stating that it was soft, that bowel sounds were hyperactive, and that it, the right lower quadrant there was no guarding or rebound or tenderness to palpation, which I assume TTP means tenderness to palpation. Were that that occurred at uh, six to seven p.m. sometime in that range, and then uh, eight hours later, the child collapses in extremis, and the record shows subsequently that there was a catastrophic intra-abdominal event. Uh, regardless of whether uh, mid gut volvulus is common or not, the peritonitis clearly is not an uncommon event. I mean, it's uncommon for the average person, but certainly it's something that you see in the emergency room frequently. So it's difficult. I mean, and there was a, there was a, at some point there was a, in the record, I can't kind of put my finger on it right now. And maybe it's the, maybe it's a, a rem, maybe it's the memory of the parents, but there was a comment about the abdominal exam being conducted with two fingers. Um, so one question for Dr. Sachs is, can you describe your normal abdominal exam um, of someone complaining of abdominal pain and nausea and vomiting? Of course, thank you for the question. Um, one quick note, um, my charted uh, history on page A26 um, charts both that there is no tenderness generally, and then the bold text that you see there um, is me free typing in the portion of the exam that I thought was most relevant to his presentation. Um, in terms of how I carry out my typical abdominal exam, I would lift the person's gown and visually inspect the abdomen. I'd auscultate first so as not to disturb bowel sounds via palpation. Uh, I'd auscultate to all four quadrants. Following that, I'd start palpation, uh, generally in the area furthest from the described pain. In this case, the patient had no pain or tenderness to palpation at the time of my exam. Um, so I would palpate. Uh, I believe what the parents may be describing in that portion of the transcript is a test for rebound, um, which is where you push two fingers into the abdominal cavity and release. And rebound tenderness is when the patient experiences more pain on release of the pressure than they do with the actual application of pressure. Um, in certain circumstances, I would also test for uh, costovertebral angle tenderness, which is uh, sort of palpation around the area of the kidneys bilaterally on the back. In this case, I don't believe I, uh, let's see, I can actually look here, let's see. Yeah, I, I did not do that in this case. Um, but that would be my typical exam process. Okay, thank you. Um, and I, I think that's the, the challenge for, for the board when we we see that uh, you know, within so Dr. Dr. Thorpe, I don't, I don't want to interrupt you, but I just want to remind you to just focus on questions as opposed to providing any insight as to what you're. Yeah, thinking. I'll, I'll, thank you, Your Honor. I appreciate that. Um, I guess the question. Please continue, Dr. Thorpe. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, pausing to think for a minute. 
Um, Dr. Thurb, may I respond to something that I think you said previously that I don't think I addressed adequately? And what was that, Dr. Sachs? Uh, Dr. Thorpe had made a comment regarding uh, the progression over hours um, of the patient's condition um, and that peritonitis would be common. So there wasn't actually a, a question about that. And so that's why I'm reminding Dr. Thorpe that we he needs to just ask questions related to what's in the record. And so there wasn't a question pending. It was more of a statement. So I'm going to ask Dr. Thorpe to follow up with questions if he has any, qu any specific questions. I guess my question would be, um, well, in part, my question would be, have you seen acute intra-abdominal catastrophe progress um, from normal to catastrophically abnormal within a six hour period of time? So I have never encountered such a rapid deterioration. Um, I think that that is likely attributable in this case to the final diagnosis for this patient, which was mid-gut volvulus, uh, which is virtually unheard of in a child this age. And I think as was noted by uh, one of the experts, uh, has the potential uh, to cause rapid de uh, decompensation, excuse me, and death in a matter of hours. Um, my understanding of this case is I suspect that the patient probably had a mild episode of torsion at home, or a brief, rather not mild, um, which caused his initial presenting symptoms. I suspect that the torsion resolved, which is why I think he had normal vital signs and a normal exam is documented. And I suspect that the torsion recurred once he was at home. Um, I would note that a, a lot of the uh, commentary on the case is regarding PO challenge and time of discharge or time of orders but the child was discharged home and there was no further occurrence of symptoms until, uh, I don't recall the exact time, I believe 3 a.m. or 4 a.m., but six or eight hours after his discharge from the hospital. So an additional you know, 30, 60 uh, or subjective period of time of monitoring would likely not have been uh, differentiating the outcome of this case. Thank you, Your Honor, that's all my questions. Questions from our board members? No further questions? All right, since there are no further questions then, um, the matter is submitted and the, uh, the record is closed. We are off the record. All right, thank you. And then Dr. Thorpe, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to you for announcement of our last case. Uh, um, so the, the uh, last case is the case um, um, for, uh, I'm trying to find my agenda again. I've been lost in this other record. Uh, here we go. Um, uh, the case of after non-adoption of the proposed decision on Rahim Shafa. Uh, and Judge, I'll, I'll uh, uh, turn that over to you and ask if uh, if the if the legal staff for Mr. Shafa, Dr. Shafa is available for. Uh, Dr. Thorpe, we're also waiting for Dr. Heelzer to return to the meeting. I sent him oh, a text message. Oh, thank you very much for reminding me. Oh, yeah. it looks like he just popped up. So yeah. we're good to proceed. And Dr. Thorpe, as you're, before you proceed, my connection is really bad. So my video goes off. I'm still here. Let's just let you know. We appreciate your, your hanging in there, Mr. Brooks. All right, and just confirming that, in fact, um, counsel, Ms. Wagner, Deputy Attorney General Wagner and attorney, uh, Mr. Ray uh, are present. Actually, it's Greg, it's Greg Chambers for the attorney general's office. Greg Chambers. All right. And also, your honor, it's Lindsay Johnson for respondent. I have the wrong names. I'm wondering, did I get those from I'm not sure where those were the ones I had? OK, let me fix that. Um, All right, then, as soon as our court reporter tells me she is ready, we will get started. Ready, Your Honor. All right, on the record. All right, good morning. We are on the record before the Medical Board of California, Panel B, in the matter of the accusation and interim suspension order against Rahim Shafa, MD, 
This is oral argument after non-adoption of the proposed decision. Medical Board case number 800-2020-070360. OAH case number 2022-080279. Today is August 20th, 2022. It's approximately 10.37 a.m. We are here at the daytime and location for the place of oral argument in the notice of hearing for oral argument. My name is Marcy Larson. I'm an administrative law judge. I've been assigned to preside over the hearing with the board members. Prior to going on the record, the board members identified themselves and a quorum was established. May I please take the appearance of the Deputy Attorney General? Greg Chambers of the Attorney General's Office representing complainant. And counsel for respondent. Good morning, Your Honor, members of the board, Lindsay Johnson, on behalf of Dr. Raheem Shafa, MD. Right, the board in this matter has issued an order of non-adoption of the proposed decision by the administrative law judge and has decided to determine the matter itself. The board is invited by a particular discussion as to whether the proposed, um, the proposed order in this matter should be modified. The following process and time limit limitations apply. Respondent will have 15 minutes to make an opening argument. The Deputy Attorney General will then have 15 minutes for a response. Respondent will then have five minutes for closing argument, and the Deputy Attorney General will likewise have five minutes for closing argument. These time limits will be strictly enforced, and I will do my best to give you a one-minute warning. The arguments shall be based only on the existing record and shall not exceed the scope of the record that's been duly admitted. No new evidence will be heard. Panel members may ask questions of the parties to clarify the arguments, but they not ask questions that would elicit new evidence. Myself and any panel member may ask a party to support the party's oral argument on a matter with a specific citation to the record. At the end of oral arguments by counsel, I will offer uh, Dr. Um, um, Dr. Shava, an opportunity to address the board with regards to the proposed order appropriate penalty. I will swear in uh, Dr. Shafa before he begins his testimony. Um, I will then ask uh, the board members if they have any questions of the parties. Um, just please remember again that um, after the oral argument, the board will go into closed session to deliberate. We will not receive uh, a decision today, but we'll receive a decision by the board sometime in the future. Please remember that all arguments must be based on the existing record and no new evidence will be heard, and that the board has already had the benefit of reading the party's briefs. All right, with that, are there any questions before we begin? No, Your Honor. All right, Ms. Johnson, if you would please tell me when you are ready. I am ready. All right, please begin. Thank you. Good morning. As the board is well aware, this is the second time that we have appeared before the board on non-adoption for this particular matter. We are here back again, addressing the idea of whether or not the board has the statutory authority to issue an interim suspension order or a suspension order under section 2310 against Dr. Shafa's license to practice medicine in the state of California. We have added a layer here, of course, on addressing the accusation, which was the order of remand that this board offered following our last non-adoption proceeding. It was at the time, and it continues to be our opinion, that the proposed decision in this matter, the one that has addressed the bulk issue of the suspension order, as well as now the issue of the accusation, is properly reasoned and supported by facts and the only interpretation of the statute that can be allowed. The crux of the issue here really is section 2310 under the Business and Profession Code section, the section that allows the board in key certain circumstances to issue a suspension order against a license in California based on disciplinary action in other states. But the key issue there is disciplinary action in other states. Section 2310 is unequivocal. It is extraordinarily clear. California only has the authority to issue a suspension order under 2310 when another state has suspended or revoked the license of a California practitioner. The record is clear in this matter that that has not happened. 
The closest the record comes is that Massachusetts and Dr. Shafa entered into a voluntary agreement together where Dr. Shafa agreed to temporarily stop practicing in Massachusetts and in any other state. This action, though, is a voluntary agreement that is not a suspension nor a revocation. And that is not simply my interpretation or Dr. Shafa's interpretation of the matter. That is what Massachusetts has told us about its own agreement. In filing the agreement with the National Practitioner Data Bank, Massachusetts specifically included in its report that this was a non-disciplinary action. The agreement itself included that this was a non-disciplinary action. And not only that, but the agreement itself mentions that if Dr. Shafa does not comply with the agreement, then Massachusetts can take the next step that it believes it could take, which is to suspend the license, indicating once again that this agreement is not a suspension or else such a need would not be outlined in the agreement. As a result, we have a voluntary agreement between a practitioner and another state, and that voluntary agreement is not a suspension or a revocation, which are the only two components listed in Section 2310 as actions that must be taken before the board can take Section 2310. Now, I understand that there might be a incentive or a desire, perhaps is a better word, for one to read in additional qualifying factors into 2310, voluntary agreement, non-practice, any other word that one might come up with. But at the end of the day, that is not what the statute says. And at the end of the day, any idea that we can read in words not listed in the statute is not supported, both by logic, but also more importantly by case law, which is outlined in the brief has been very clear. When the legislature tells us what it means by including certain words in a statute, we are not allowed to expand on that with words that we might want to have included in the statute. And the legislature knew about voluntary agreements and it knew about the idea that some states and some practitioners might agree not to practice medicine and yet it did not include that in section 2310. And therefore, it is not our job or more importantly, our ability to read that into the statute. And that is what is so clear in the proposed decision here. The statute does not cover the facts of this case. And therefore, we cannot operate under the idea that that statute one does, or two, that we can operate under the idea that that statute allows the board at this point in time and in this matter to use that statute for its jurisdiction. We then turn to the second matter that has been raised in this action, that of the accusation itself. It should be noted, and I believe it has been noted in written arguments, so I apologize for reiterating it, but we have already looked at the accusation in this matter. The board has already looked at the accusation in this matter, and via its own hearing brief in the original hearing on this matter, concluded that the issues in the accusation were not ripe yet. And nothing in the underlying matter has changed that would suddenly ripen those issues. The only thing that respondent can find on our side that has changed is that the board has learned that it does not have the statutory authority under section 2310 and has now proceeded to move for a different disciplinary action. However, under section 2305, that which is listed in the accusation, there is still not a case there, and therefore the statute is not met and discipline cannot be sustained. How do we know the statute's not met there? Well, one, like I said, we have the benefit of complainant's hearing brief on this matter, in which it acknowledges that the issues were not ripe. And since nothing has changed about the underlying issues, there is nothing to indicate, both facts and presentation, that suddenly the issues have ripened. But second, we can turn to the statute itself, which certainly addresses whether or not another state has taken an action, and this time it does broaden beyond just suspension and revocation, something 2310 does not do. But section 2305 has a different and equally important component, that the action taken by the other state must be based on something that would be disciplinary or discipline worthy in California. We are limited in the record on this matter, but what we do know is that Massachusetts and Dr. Shafa entered into the voluntary agreement on the basis of pending criminal charges. 
there has been no conviction in this matter. There has been no evidence that establishes that those charges have any merit. And pending criminal charges in California is not alone on its own worthy of disciplinary action. As a result, the board is unable to meet the second equally critical component of section 2305, which is very clear that in order for the state, in order for California to take what is essentially reciprocal discipline, it must be based on underlying factors that would be discipline worthy on their own in California. We simply don't have that. Criminal convictions, of course. Criminal allegations, no. And because we do not have those criminal convictions, then certainly the idea alone that when somebody is simply charged with a crime, that we can move solely on that basis without establishing any other underlying factor or any other line basis is simply not supported by case law. It's simply not supported by due process. And it is absolutely not supported by the standard of evidence that is required in licensing matters. For an accusation, it is very clear. The underlying factors or the case itself must be supported by clear and convincing evidence. We don't even need to address that because we don't even come to the bar of that level. So as a result, we turn back to the entire picture, which I'm sure at this point, given the length of this matter and, and the fact that we're all here again, the board has a pretty good grasp of. There are two issues at factor here. The initial suspension that the board has levied, which is very clear under the statute, does not have the authority here due to the fact that it is required that another state suspend or revoke the license. And we have neither a suspension nor a revocation. And the accusation, which is based on issues that certainly have not ripened by essentially all counts, and is based on the idea that Massachusetts's voluntary agreement has some sort of underlying action that California can discipline for. At the end of the day, the facts of this case and this case itself are rather limited, rather brief. And that's because the law ultimately controls here. And the law, based on the two statutes, and a very clear, plain reading of the statute without anybody having to or trying to insert words in order to make their case one way or another is very clear. And that very clear reading of the law is also supplemented by the very clear entry by Massachusetts in this matter, which has told us and has told the California board that this is not a disciplinary matter from Massachusetts. For California to then tell Massachusetts that it in fact is a disciplinary matter would be overstepping. This is not simply my read of the statute. This is not simply respondents read of the statute. This is the read of the statute by an administrative law judge, not once, but twice in this matter. Twice now, an administrative law judge has issued a proposed decision that has found exactly what respondent is arguing. That the suspension order should be rescinded because statute does not support it and that the accusation should be dismissed because ultimately the facts and the law do not support it. And for these reasons, we respectfully request that the proposed decision be adopted as the order in this case, and that the now 21 month suspension that Dr. Shafa has suffered under no statutory authority be rescinded and the corresponding accusation be dismissed. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Wagner, if you would please tell me when you are ready. Uh, it's Greg Chambers. I'm sorry, Chambers. That's yes, okay, sorry. not a problem. I saw that and I, I still have Mr. Wagner's name in my mind. Mr. Chambers, if you would please tell me when you were ready. Thank you. Council was correct and gave a very concise recitation of the issues before us. Yet the issue is really clear as mud. So I'd like, like you to look at the uh, proposed decision, paragraph four, page six. And in that paragraph, the ALJ quotes suspended and revoked outright, close quote. But the word that the ALJ doesn't put in is the word restriction. And that's kind of important because when this agreement was signed by both the licensee and the state of Massachusetts, Massachusetts complied with a federal law. It is 45 Code of Federal Regulations, part 60.8. And Pursuant to that statute, 
the state of Massachusetts had to file a document with the National Practitioners Data Bank. And they had to do that because the statute declares that when each board of medical examiners, they have to report to the NP, the National Practitioners Data Bank, any actions based on reasons relating to the physician's professional competence or professional conduct, which revokes or suspends or otherwise restricts a physician's license. Here, the state of Massachusetts restricted this individual's license. And Dr. Shafa cannot unilaterally go back and say, you know what, this is just kind of like a informal surrender or a timeout or vacation. This was restricted by the state of Massachusetts. They decide when he ends this indefinite suspension or restriction. We'll call it a restriction because that's what it is. Because when we look at the document, which is Exhibit 7, that was presented to the ALJ at the hearing, they presented the National Practitioners Data Bank filing, quote, based on the subject's professional competence or conduct, which adversely affected or could have adversely affected the health or welfare of patients, close quote. And you can find that at Bates page A alpha 30. And that's important because it could, we have the first part, which is a restriction. That's the mandate for 2305. And then the second component, which is, would this be something that could be disciplined in California? And under 2233, 34, we have unprofessional conduct because they restricted him based on, quote, based on the subject's professional competence or conduct, which adversely affected or could have adversely affected the welfare, the health or welfare of patients, close quote. Counsel's correct. We do not yet have a conviction. So we're not here on a conviction case. We're here on the filing by the state of Massachusetts, which had two parts. One, the restriction in which the licensee signed the document and the state of Massachusetts signed the document and their filing, which said that they were concerned about his, pra his practice and his actions up to that point. And that's the second component of 2305. So yes, this has been 21 months. We have gone back and forth with a couple of hearings, but the components for 2305 have been met. And we, we submit at that point. Thank you. All right, Ms. Johnson, you will have five minutes for closing argument. Please tell me when you are ready. I am ready. You may start. Thank you. I agree with counsel on two points, and those are the two where he indicated that I was correct. <laughs> and I suppose that might just be a bias speaking, but ultimately, at the end of the day, it's my opinion and it's respondents' opinion that we are actually correct on every level. And part of that can start with the argument that I just heard from the attorney general's office talking about how this is a restriction. In particular, we were directed to look at ALJ Cox's proposed decision and look at page six, paragraph four, where it was noted that she does not include the words and restricted in her quotes on that paragraph. I agree with that. The reason she does not include the word restricted though is because the word restricted is not in the statute that she is obligated to follow. 2310 does not include the word restricted. It states that this board may suspend the license if there is a suspension or if there is a revocation. And we simply do not have that here. We have a voluntary agreement. And the reason that it would not be included in the proposed decision, the word restriction, is because that's not what the statute tells us. And ultimately, at the end of the day, regardless of anyone's personal feelings or desires, the statute is what governs us, controls us, and is what everyone is obligated to follow. It is also clear when it comes to the accusation that once again, nothing has changed in this matter. The issues have not ripened. In looking at whether or not the board can discipline based on out of state or alleged out of state discipline, the statute in the accusation is also clear. There must not only be a reciprocal action by another state, but it must also include or be based on an action that is discipline worthy in California. And there has been absent one notation that keeps being pointed out to on the National Practitioner Data Bank, which does not include any actual factual basis. Any argument or any evidence or any factual basis that explains why, if at all, respondents should be disciplined in California and what the underlying basis for that would be. 
And that is what is critical. That is what is missing. And that is what is accurately pointed out by the administrative law judge in this matter. We do not have anything beyond the idea that Dr. Shafa has been charged with a crime. And that continues to not be cause for discipline based on the statute outlined in the accusation. And we continue to have absolutely no evidence that Dr. Shafa's license was suspended or revoked in Massachusetts. And that is what is required in the statute for the suspension. And as a result, we have no evidence and we have no statutory support behind anything that would deviate from this proposed decision. And it's for that reason that we respectfully request the proposed decision be adopted. Thank you. Mr. Chambers, if you would please tell me when you are ready for your five minute closing argument. We're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. And counsel was correct with regard to 2310 and we would direct to 2305, which does have the word restriction in it. And the word restriction, which is addressed in the filings pursuant to the federal code and the statutory language, which was provided and addressed in the National Practitioners Data Bank filing by the state of Massachusetts with regard to the uh, actions of the licensee and the effect on the consumers of that state, which would then be unprofessional conduct within California. So at that point in time, we would submit, Your Honor. Ms. Johnson, does Dr. Shafa wish to address the board with regards to the proposed order? No, Your Honor, we believe this is a legal issue. All right, then I'm gonna ask our board members if they have any questions for counsel, starting with our chair, Dr. Thorpe, do you have any questions for counsel? Um, I, again, I will defer to my, my uh, colleagues on the panel um, to right, have Dr. a chance to do that first. Dr. Heltzer, do you have, uh, have any questions for counsel? No questions, thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Brooks, any questions? I do, and it's, it, it, this is a question for our council. For uh, does the code specifically use the word restriction? Does the statute, excuse me, specifically use the word restriction? And are and are we applying that code um, in the right manner? Uh, is this is this to, to, to Mr. Chambers? Uh, to Mr. Chambers. Okay, yes. so 2310 does not use the word restriction as Ms. Johnson pointed out, 2305 does have that word in it. And I cannot tell you whether you are address, uh, addressing the code in the proper manner. I think that's something you would have to talk to Ms. Webb about. And Ms. Webb, same question for you. Or Ms. Webb's not here, I'm sorry. Same question for Ms. Johnson, I'm sorry. Of course, uh, 2310, I agree, does not include the word restricted which is why we are arguing that it should not be read into the statute because that is beyond the bounds of the statute and case law has told us that we cannot read words in that are not contained. And so since 2310 does not include restriction and it appears that we all agree that this is not suspension or revocation, then it is our argument that when you try to read in new words not contained in the statute, then at that point you are violating the statute. Thank you. All right, Ms. Young, any questions for counsel? Um, one question for Mr. Chambers. Mr. Chambers, I believe that you were reading um, a quote from, I believe it was the Massachusetts equivalent of the medical board um, related to the voluntary agreement. And I think that you cited to page A30 of the administrative record, but I just wanted to confirm um, what, Yes, saying. and I think if you note on my written argument filing, I had not received the entire administrative record at the time of the filing, but I do know that A30, it was Exhibit 7 in our hearing. So I don't know what administrative record, if you have the complete administrative record, maybe Ms. Johnson has or has not. I, I can't answer that. Okay, because I'm looking at A30 right now. What I see is mostly redacted. Um, yes, so that my guess is that's not the um, Exhibit 7 from our most recent hearing, which was January 27, 2022. Okay, I'll look for that. Thank you. And on, on that note, I know you didn't ask me, but we actually do not have the completed record either. So our A30 for Exhibit 7 matches what Mr. Chambers is articulating. 
Understood. Lost, I'm sorry, go ahead and miss out. Any additional questions? No. All right, Ms. Lawson, any questions for, for council? No, thank you. All right, going back to Dr. Thorpe, any questions for council? I have no further questions. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, no further questions from the board then? All right, then the matter is submitted and we are off the record. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. And Dr. Thorpe, I will turn it back to you. Dr. Thorpe, I believe you're muted. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, um, at this point, I would suggest that we take a, I don't know, five or 10 minute break uh, between the open and the closed session. Um, and we readjourn at say 1110 from, uh, in the closed session. Um, and uh, thank you for to everyone on the call here for for your attendance today. We'll we'll re we'll reconfigure uh, at eleven ten in the closed session. Thank, thank you, there. And for all the board members, you'll have a meeting titled "Closed Session Deliberations." Eleven thirty was the start time on that. So if you've already accepted that, it might be on your calendars already. But you'll find the link and the password in that email there. Uh, please let me know if you have any problems. We'll see you over there at 11.10. That meeting's now open if you want to try to join first. Thank you. For all the other public attendees, we will be, oh, and um, Judge Larson, I advise, uh, Court Reporter Farrell, um, I don't know if Judge Larson got the information that she needed for you. I just saw her disconnect, but uh, usually they need your court reporter number and those number of pages if you can send that to her. Um, yes, I'm trying to see if I have the email. I do have the email for OAH. Should I send it to that? Sean or? Um, yeah, I sent it to the OAH Sacramento email. And if you wouldn't mind, CC me too, just in case. So we have it. You got it. I'll, I'll get that done right now. Thank you so much, Kelly. Have a good day. Thank you. You too, Sean. Bye-bye. For all the other public attendees, we'll be uh, now uh, putting up a message for closed session until we return after the deliberations. It's expected that the deliberations will take uh, quite a while, and then they have some other um, matters to attend to in the closed session. So it's probably going to be a few hours before we return, but this meeting will remain open until that time uh, that they return to officially adjourn. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Um, so panel B is. Uh, called to order again at 1219 um, for the purpose of adjournment <laughs> and uh, uh, a motion for adjournment would be in order. I move to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of adjournment. I guess, Carrie, do we need to take roll call? We have historically not taken roll call for adjournment. I think you okay. just call the meeting to close. Okay. I think it's a unanimous decision unless there's some objection to closing the meeting. We'll call the meeting adjourned. Thanks for your patience, everyone, and we hope you have a good day. Thank you. Have a nice Thanks, day. Everyone. Okay. Bye bye.